Hi guys, this is the second video in the two part series on Docker and how to use it with Ignition. So in this video, we're going to continue, uh, if we're going to cover a few other topics we didn't cover in the first video because I didn't want it to be too long. So the first step you want to take is to start up your Docker desktop. How I started it up is there are a few other ways actually, but I double click this Docker desktop takes about a minute on my machine to start it up. If you select it to start up Docker on Windows startup, it'll already be running for you. Um, but if it isn't, you can always start it. Either search for Docker in the, in the start menu here or double click it on the desktop and you can start it that way. So now that I know that it's started, um, I should ha also have a notification here. I do see that it's started we can go ahead and continue with our demonstration. So let me open a command prompt. And let's go ahead and create a new container. So we last in the last video, we created a container based on inductive automations, ignition image. So let's do the same thing. This will be good practice. Uh, I already have it open here in Docker Hub. So inductive automation slash ignition. And of course, if you don't have a Docker Hub account, uh, first of all, you should make one, but you can also just copy this command uh, on the screen, or I'll leave a link in the description um, and run it in your terminal. It doesn't ask for any, any sort of uh, login information or anything like that. So I'm going to run this in my terminal. So Docker run dash D is detached. And then I'm going to map these ports here, 9088 to 8088. So 8088 on the container is the port maps to 9088 on my machine. So, and then I want to give this container a name, call it ignition dash test. Uh, specify the image I want it to use. So inductive, oops, automation ignition. I don't want to add the the tag that it uses there 816 because I downloaded a previous version and I don't want it to go through the download process. And then I want to give this a few more flags and fields. You can read what all these flags mean just below where my terminal is covering right now. Let me show you here. And then I want to run that command and it returns uh, an alphanumeric string. And that string is the ID of the container that we just started up. Here are the flags and what they mean. This page already looks a little bit different than it did like a week ago. But that just means inductive automation added more information here. Okay, so we started up, up, we started up a container uh, and here's the ID. So you can verify that a container is running by running the command docker container ls and you get the container ID and image and other properties of the container. Or you can also do the shorthand notation docker ps and get the same information. So once we have that information, let's go ahead and go to our browser and refresh. You weren't supposed to see that first screen. That was from a different take. But here, this, this is what happens when you spin up a container. You're going to get this window here. So as you can see, the port 9088 is, uh, the, is a local port on my machine, and it maps to port 8088 on the container. So obviously, if you're spinning up uh, several of these servers, you don't want to map to port 9088 because you won't be able to access all of those from your host machine. I actually don't know what the behavior will be in that case, but you want to map from port 9089, for example, for a second server to port 8088 for the container. That's pretty obvious. So let's go ahead and go through the installation, the installation of, the, of Ignition on this container. I'm going to, first of all, read those and agree to those. And you can see how fast uh, starting up and launching a gateway is on a container versus on your machine or on a server. Of course, I would not run a container in production. Well, it's because I don't fully understand um, fault tolerance and 
backups and everything else that goes into running a server successfully for long periods of time. Um, I don't understand fully uh, how you would do that in Docker. Uh, but you can use this for testing, as you'll see, they're very fast. So that took about a minute to run the command in the command prompt and install, run through the rest of the installation of the ignition, of, of the ignition installation uh, on the container. So it took about a minute, very easy, very quick, and you're going to get the same environment, regardless whether you run it on a Windows or on a Linux server or on a Mac, you'll get the same environment if you're using Docker. Okay, let's let's look at some of the properties that come with um, Docker, with the Docker container. Uh, these properties are specified on the on the container uh, in the properties that inductive automation sets for their containers. So inductive automation builds an image that you that usually that usually uh, that usually requires a file called a Docker file, which has a bunch of commands, and those commands define what the image is going to do, and then we pull the image and then create containers from that image. But let's look at some of the properties, like I said. So if we go to the status and use our super secure login information admin password, we can see uh, the memory usage, and we can see what version we're running. So 815 is the version, uh, is the version of the image I downloaded from Docker Hub about a week ago. So that's the installation we have. We go to performance you can see that we get uh, one gigabyte of memory so this is my physical memory on my machine uh, being used and we have some allocation of the CPU this could be either a core uh, or just a few threads I'm not sure what it is in this case and I'm pretty sure you can customize this um, so it's a I wouldn't run this as a production as a server in production unless you set uh, significant amounts of resources so not like I have here you may be wondering how do you access the container and how do you navigate around it and add and modify some of the files in the container well let's go into that next let's go back into my command prompt window here and run a command that you can see here I have the documentation open for uh, it's called docker exec. Exec stands for execute or run, run a command. Uh, so we're going to use this command here. Let's go ahead and run it. Uh, we're going to use a few flags. So docker exec dash i dash t. You can see what those mean here. So dash i is uh, an interactive keep standard input open even if not attached. Dash t is allocate a pseudo TTY. It's a pseudo terminal, I'm guessing. I don't fully understand those, but I do know that this command works. You can also shorten down that notation, just do dash IT. This is true for in a lot of cases when using flags. And then we specify our container ID or name. So let's see, we called it ignition ignition test, or you can also specify the first few characters of the container ID. So three characters should be enough there, unless you have many different containers and have very similar container IDs. And then what do we want to execute? So this is the, the actual command we want to execute. So let's do a few different commands. Let's run uh, touch. Touch creates a new file. Let's call it new underscore file dot text. So it'll create a new file. And then we want to echo hello world. I've never, I haven't tried this before, by the way, so this might not work into our new file dot text. So this is an example of, ah, this is an example of a command. So these are valid commands that you can run in a Linux environment. So touch new file dot text will create a new file called new file dot text in your current location. And then we're going to echo hello world, pipe it into that file. Basically, just add it to that file. If we run this here, uh, okay, let's run something else. That didn't work, of course, because I didn't try it beforehand. Let's run a command that I know will work. 
let's execute um, the bash term or bash scripting environments. So here we go, docker exec, exec is the function we want, dash it are the flags, 409 is the container ID, and then we want to execute bin bash. So basically just open up a terminal and there we can see, um, we can see that our prompt changed from my location I'm launching the command prompt from to root and then at the container ID. So for example, we can, and then we see we opened up in the ignition location. So if you do, here's where you would use the, uh, uh, is where you would use Linux commands. If you do ls, you'll see your ignition.shell. So if we do a cat ignition.shell, you can see the commands there. You can see what that, what that file looks like. Uh, what else do we have here? So it's basically, as you can see now, it's a mini version of Linux. Let's do uh, display it again. We can see that we have our data. So let's look at what the data has, what the data directory has as our certificates, modules, whatever else. Uh, let's also look at lib. So it has more information. And then the last thing I want to show you is, is bin. Oh, is user lib. User lib. So if you're familiar with Ignition at all, you'll know, you'll recognize this structure as the same structure you're going to get on a, or a very similar structure you're going to get on a, on an Ignition installation, for example, on a Windows server or a different server. So this is the location where you would drop in uh, Pi files to get different functionalities, for example. Okay, so as you can see, we are inside of the container and we're executing commands directly on the container. So let me show you what I mean. Say we want to modify a file well, let's actually change back there, so local. Um, well, let's see. Okay, so say you want to add so I'm going to go back to the location to start it off in. Uh, so what file can we modify there? I don't really want to screw anything up, uh, but it is a container, so we should be able to just create another one if we screw something up. Um, so what can we modify there? Let's go to the data directory and see what we have in here. Oh, okay, there we go, ignition.conf. So if you're familiar with, it, with Ubuntu at all, or Linux, I should say, there are different uh, notepad applications, notepad-like applications text editors, and we're going to use one now. There's one called nano. So let's say nano ignition.conf. This should not work, most likely. Yeah, nano command not found. It's because we didn't install nano. So let's do an apt, APT git install nano, uh, unable to locate package nano. At this point, we can try apt get apt get update and it's going to update um, our our lists of repositories that are available to us I believe that's probably not accurate I also hope you can't hear all the noise in the background um, yeah so let's wait for this to update our lists and then and then we can we should be able to install so either nano or vim vim also if you tried modifying it vim wouldn't be available either that was the last this is the last thing i'm going to show in this video and then we can go on from there so let's do apt git install nano apt is the package manager and we're going to fetch and install nano and now we can do nano 
ignition.com and we should be able to open it up and we have a text editor and it's much easier to use than Vim if you've used Vim in the past. So we can take a look at the different settings that are set here. If you've used ignition for any sort of time, uh, you've dealt with the ignition.conf file. This is where you set, for example, shared drives. At least that's where it was. So let's look at some of the settings here. Let's try to find where Okay, I didn't see, it's not immediately clear to me where that one gigabyte of memory was coming from. But it, it's probably in here somewhere. Very technical. Oh, okay, there we go. I saw it just now. Maximum Java heap size in megabytes. I'm assuming this is, um, this is that property that we saw set. So let's go ahead. Let's change it. It's the worst thing that can happen, right? Let's set it to two gigabytes, and then we can hit Control X, uh, yes, and overwrite the file. Um, let's run. So let's run gwcmd.shell dash r or gwcmd.sh dash r restart the gateway and then <laughs> I'm actually interested what's going to happen uh, it doesn't really matter it's not a production system it's obviously a container so we should be able to play around with it hopefully I don't screw up my Windows machine which I don't think I will so if we refresh this we should see that it's oh looks like it just booted us out let's log in And there we go. We can see that our our memory here, allocated memory, increased. Let's also look at the task manager here and look at performance and the memory that's being used. So if we mo monitor this, and then so that is all about all I wanted to show you guys, because that's all I've been interested in for the time being for Docker. When I set up a cluster of um, ignition servers, I'll make another video. Um, but as you can see, I hope this kind of demonstrates what ignition or what, yeah, what the ignition gateway looks like in the Docker container. I don't wanna end this process, but I kind of do. So let's just hit Control X. Gateway is now running. Okay, let me exit from my container. Oops. I can't type back into my terminal and let me do docker ps uh, take a look at my memory so I'm at 9.2 gigabytes usage I'm going to terminate container rm f force remove container 409 and let's look what happens to my memory it goes down by less than I expected it to, but I guess that's what the ignition server was using, it's elastic memory. Okay, that is about all I wanted to show, because that is all about, about all I know about um, the topic of ignition and Docker, and using those together. If you have questions, let me know in the comments below, I'll try to help out with what I can. I may be able to point you in the direction of some resources like this, document here. You can also search Docker documents, docs.docker.com. This will, of course, time out now. Uh, and look through the documentation on different image, on different images. Uh, but like I said, that's about all I have for today. If you have questions, let me know either on Discord or in the comments. Myself and this community that we're now a part of maybe involuntarily, we will try to do our best to help. Um, but that is it. Thank you for watching my videos, for being so supportive, for joining the Discord. Uh, but that is it for me. I will see you in the next video.